Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. All praise is due to God, Lord of the universe. And may God's peace and blessings be upon all of his prophets and messengers, including his final and beloved messenger, the seal of the prophets, Muhammad, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, and his purified household and righteous companions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, الشيطان يعيدكم الفقر ويأمركم بالفحشاء والله يعيدكم المخفرة منه وفضلا والله واسع عليم يؤت الحكمة من يشاء ومن يؤت الحكمة فقد أوت خيرا كثيرا وما يذكر إلا أول الألباب. God states, Satan threatens you with poverty and commands you to indecency. And God promises you forgiveness from him and bounty. And God is all-encompassing, all-knowing. He grants wisdom to whomsoever he wills. And whosoever is granted wisdom by God has been granted much good. Amanna billah. Sadaqallahu al-aliyu al-azim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Let us once again enliven our hearts and minds in gathering with the remembrance of the Holy Prophet and his purified progeny. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. One of God's greatest blessings and greatest gifts upon us is that he has bestowed us with the intellect, al-aql. This is one of God's greatest gifts. The reports, many reports, they tell us that one of, that God's first, very first creation in this universe was the intellect. The first thing that God created was the intellect. And that God tested this creation. You know, sometimes we find that when we put something together, a scientist, when he or she puts something together in order to ensure that it is functioning property, properly, he or she will do what? They'll test it. Uh, undergo certain tests. God, the reports tell us after God fashioned and created the intellect, the very first creation, God tested the intellect, a test of obedience. And that the intellect, it passed this test successfully. And after it passed the test, God told the intellect, intellect, you are the standard by which I will hold my creation accountable. The intellect is the standard. How do we know how we're going to be held accountable by God through our intellect. The intellect is the standard. That is how God holds us accountable. Why? Because the intellect simply gives us the ability to distinguish right from wrong and good from bad. That's how we know many of the things. How do we know many of the things they are right or wrong? The intellect tells you deep down inside. Yes, when it comes to revelation, certainly revelation has a role, a primary role. But the reports, they tell us that God has sent to humanity and to God's creation two types or two means of divine guidance, two methods of divine guidance. One is an external, an outer method of divine guidance, and that is the prophets and the messengers. God, over the course of history, sent thousands, tens of thousands of prophets and messengers to all communities. To do what? So that they can proclaim, they can guide the communities, 
They can remind them of their responsibility before God, guide them towards God. And many of them, they were messengers. They were given scriptures. They were given holy texts and scriptures. This is, the reports tell us, these are the external messengers or the external guidance that God sends, prophets and messengers and divine scriptures. But the other method is an internal guidance, is an internal means of guidance, and that is al-aql, the intellect. That God has given each and every one of us this internal moral and intellectual compass. It's like each of us has been pre-programmed by God with a GPS system. Many of us now, we can't leave our homes without our GPS system. Even if you're familiar, even if you're familiar with the roads and the routes, oftentimes you'll turn on the GPS system. Why? Because sometimes, especially here in LA, there's always traffic. You want to figure out what's the fastest route. The GPS system is going to give you the best route. Sometimes it'll even give you the most, more fuel efficient route nowadays with rising gas prices, right? You want the best route. So we all depend on this GPS system to get us from point A to point B in the most efficient manner. God has pre-programmed each and every one of us with an internal GPS system, an internal moral and intellectual compass that allows us to distinguish right from wrong. It empowers us to make the right decisions, to make the correct decisions. Now, here, these reports, they tell us that there is revelation, there is prophets and messengers, and there is intellect and reason. These are two forms of divine guidance. But for some people, belief and faith on the one hand and reason and intellect on the other hand, these are antithetical to one another. For some people, these two, when we say intellect or reason and we say faith and belief, these are contradictory. They are antithetical to one another. They do not work in tandem. They, conf they conflict with one another. This is why we find that many people, for example, they'll tell you that belief is irrational. Faith is irrational. A lot of people will say this, that faith and belief is irrational. It does not sit well with reason, with intellect, with science, or they'll tell you that reason always trumps faith. Reason always trumps belief. I never thought I would use the word reason and trump in the same sentence. They tell you reason trumps faith or reason trumps belief. Or on the other side, so you have some people who will tell you that reason does not come together, does not, or faith does not conform to reason, that belief is irrational. Or on the other side, sometimes you'll have some who will tell you that there is no room for reason in faith. They kick reason out. They do not give any room to reason and to the intellect. They tell you, faith is the most important thing. Don't reason. Don't use your intellect. Follow blindly. This is what is expected. It's expected of you to follow blindly. Don't ask any questions. Do not ask any questions. Just accept based on belief and faith. So you have some people who may consider faith and belief with reason and intellect to be contradictory, to be antithetical to one another. But when we come to Islam, especially when we come to the school of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, we find that our teachings, they tell us that faith and belief and reason and intellect, they are complementary to one another. They work with one another. They nurture one another. They are not antithetical to one another but for faith to be complete for it to be effective for belief to get us where it needs to get us we are always reminded and encouraged to utilize our intellect look at the quran from beginning to end how many verses in the quran remind us 
They tell us that God has sent signs لِقَوْمٍ يَعْقِلُونَ To those who reflect, those who use their intellect. لِقَوْمٍ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Those who think. لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ Those who have been given intellect. The Qur'an is filled with verses, always reminding us of the power and the importance of intellect and of reason in understanding and recognizing our responsibility in this life and in on, on our journey of faith. So we have to take care of our intellects. Now what is the intellect? When we ask, what is the intellect? What is it? How is it defined? How is it known? Of course, we can spend a lot of time speaking about this subject. Scholars have written books, volumes, discussing the importance and significance and the definition of al-aql, intellect. What is it? But we don't have that time. So tonight, we will focus on the statements of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, who defines for us, who teaches us what intellect is. He defines for us al-aql. What is intellect? And what is its place and what is its value in our lives? Imam Ali, alayhi salam, he says in one hadith, he says, al ruqiyun ila alliyin. He says that intellect is the ladder that allows you to transcend to the highest stations of paradise. Aliyin, we talk about Aliyin, the Quran talks about Aliyin. Aliyin is usually understood to be the highest station in paradise. Aliyin from A'la, from being high, lofty, the loftiest and the highest place in paradise. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, if you want to reach up there, the best ladder, the best elevator that you can take up there is what? Is the intellect. This is the value of the intellect. It allows us, it gives us the means to reach the highest of stations. In another hadith, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, Al-aqlu khalilu al-mar. That the intellect is man's best friend. We say a dog is a man's best friend, right? A lot of people say a dog is a man's best friend. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, the intellect is your best friend. The intellect is that which is most loyal to you. It is the most important tool and the most important means to the divine that God has given you. And so it should be like your best friend, very, very close to you. You should take care of it just like you take care of your friend. So we know that the intellect is valuable. We know that it's important. We know that it's our best friend. It is our most powerful tool. And that we have to take care of it. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he goes on to teach. He doesn't just define for us the value of the intellect. He also describes for us the essence of the intellect and what strengthens this intellect. And here, the lessons that Imam Ali alayhi salam gives us, he's not talking about some of the physical things that we can do to strengthen our intellect. Because now you can go and you can talk to specialists and they'll tell you there are certain diets, foods, certain exercises, certain things that you can do in this life to strengthen your mind. We're not talking about the physical mind here. Intellect is something above the physical mind, the brain. This is something that requires extra effort, extra attention that is not necessarily, does not necessarily come from the food that we eat or the exercise that we do. That's all great and it's all important. But the intellect is something above, strictly speaking, the mind and the brain, the physical brain. So Imam Ali alayhi salam, he tells us there are some things that we can do that will strengthen our intellect. It will strengthen, it will give it its greatest capacity. And when we strengthen our intellect, then it does its job very well. It gets us to where we need to go. In one hadith, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, العقل أن تقول ما تعرف وتعمل بما تنطق به. He says two things. Reason, intellect, is defined by two things. Number one, he says that you speak 
or you say only what you know. Intellect is that you speak only what you know. You say only what you know. And this is what the Quran tells us. God tells us in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ Do not utter, do not say that which you have no knowledge of. Why? The Quran says, because your eyes and ears and your tongue and your heart and your mind will all be held to account by God. We'll stand before God on the day of judgment and God will say, why did you utter this statement? What's your proof for this thing that you said? Sometimes we underestimate, we assume it's just words, it's just sounds that we make. They're just statements that we say. But the Quran reminds us that our statements, we are held to account for the things that we say. And that we should not speak unless we are sure of that which is what we are saying is, is true, is real. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, do not say something unless you know that thing. Today, nowadays we find that almost everyone is an expert on almost everything. Everything. Everyone has an opinion about everything. Medicine, an issue related to medicine, everyone is a medical professional, medical pro expert. They all have advice. Look with COVID. Everyone has their own medicine for COVID. Everyone has their own solution for this medical crisis. You tell someone you're sick, you'll get 20 different, 50 different recipes. Everyone is a medical expert, huh? Look at politics. Everyone is an expert political analyst. Everyone has a say. You ask them about any political situation in the world, they'll have something to say. They always have something to say. And added to this, so medicine and politics, added to this, I would add also religion. Everyone is an expert in religion. They give their expert opinion. Right? Almost. Whether we know or we don't know, oftentimes we like to give our opinions and we do so as though we absolutely know, as though we are experts in every field. Whereas the Quran, the traditions, they remind us not to speak unless we know. Don't say something if you're not sure of it. In fact, Imam Ali tells us that the most knowledgeable person is the one who when he or she does not know, admits it. They say, I don't know. This is counterintuitive. We don't like to admit that we don't know. We like to give an answer for everything, right? We don't like to admit. Imam Ali says the most knowledgeable person is the one who says, I don't know. I don't know. If you don't know, you say, you admit, you say, I don't know. Ask someone else. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ The Quran says, ask those who know. If you don't know, ask those who know. Right? So here, Imam Ali says one element of aql, intellect, the essence of intellect, is that you do not speak what you do not know. The other, he says, وَتَعْمَلَ بِمَا تَنْطِقُ بِهِ The other element is that you act upon what you say. So don't say what you don't know. And when you say something, make sure that you act upon the thing that you say. Again, come to the Qur'an. God tells us in the Qur'an, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا This verse is directed to whom? To the believers in particular. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُوا O oh, you who believe, God says, why do you say things that you do not act upon? Why do you give advice, you admonish others, you tell them, you speak with them, you say fancy things, but when it comes to you, you don't act upon the things that you say. Why? Kabura maqtan, the Quran continues, Kabura maqtan inda Allahi an taqulu ma la taf'alun. It's a big sin, a big crime with God that we say things but we don't act upon the things that we say. We don't practice what we preach. How many times do we find ourselves in this situation? Our parents, for example. Parents, many times, 
As parents, we tell our children to be respectful. We tell them to be truthful. We tell them not to use bad words, but they hear us use bad words all the time. We tell them to be respectful to others, but they hear us and they see us humiliate others and bother others and harm others and talk about them. We tell our children to be modest, but we are not modest ourselves. We tell them to be truthful, but we are not truthful ourselves. How many times do we find ourselves in this situation? Or between spouses, between friends, we often guide, we admonish, we give advice to one another, but we don't always act on that advice. And this is called what? What's the word for this? What is the word for this? When we do not act upon what we say, what's the word for it? I'm asking you, brothers and sisters. Hypocrisy and nifaq. And if the Quran says, Lima taquluna ma la taf'aloon. Sometimes we show care or concern, but it's fake care or fake concern. I read once that a man, he approached a wealthy philanthropist. He went to, this wealthy philanthropist was known to always help people. He had charitable impulses. He never said no to anyone and he would get deeply emotional. So the man goes to this wealthy philanthropist and he tells him, listen, I need to speak to you about a really grave situation. There's a family in our district here close by. You know, this family, they break our hearts. This family, they have their father died and the mother is very ill, she's very sick, she's not able to work. And the nine children that they have, they're very hungry. And they're not able to make ends meet. And soon they were going to be evicted from their home because they are un unable to pay rent. Their rent is $500 a month. They're unable to. So soon they're going to be kicked out onto the street. So the wealthy philanthropist, you know, he was moved. He said, you know, this is terrible. This situation is terrible. Can I ask you, what's your relationship to this family? The man, he was sobbing. He began to wipe his tears. He looked up. He said, sir, I'm their landlord. How many times do we show fake concern? We say, oh, these people are pro poor. We should help the poor. We should assist the needy. But when it comes time for us to helping the poor and assisting the needy, we don't act upon the things that we encourage. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَا تَقُولُونَ مَا لَا تَفْعَلُونَ So Imam Ali says, Aql, in one hadith, he says, Aql is made up of two things. Intellect is made up of two things. One is that you only speak or you only say that which you know. And number two, that you act upon what you preach. You act upon what you say. This is one hadith. In another hadith, Imam Ali defines for us, he tells us how we strengthen our intellect, how we strengthen it. He says, بِتَرْكِ مَا لَا يُعْنِيكِ يَتِمُّ لَكَ الْعَقْلِ He says, if you want to maximize the potential and strengthen your intellect, you should avoid those things that do not concern you. Don't be nosy, in other words. Don't be overly curious. Sometimes we find ourselves or others around us overly curious. They want to find out everything about everyone. Oh, what did they say? What did this, our neighbor say? Oh, did you see what they brought, what they brought into their house? Oh, she did this, he did that. What's wrong with this guy? What did this guy say? What did that guy do? Overly curious. They want to know everything, even things that don't concern them. Always asking, always meddling, always interfering. Fuzul. Fuzul, huh? Always meddling and interfering in things that do not concern them. Imam Ali says, if you want your intellect to be strengthened and maximized, avoid those things that do not concern you. Stay away from them. In fact, the Quran tells us this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Qur'an, 
He says, لا تسألوا عن أشياء إن تبدأ لكم تسؤكم. Don't ask about some things that if you find the answer to them, if you find out the answer to them, it's going to bother you. It's going to annoy you. Don't ask about them. Right? We say ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is not bliss. But the things that don't concern me, when it comes to things that don't concern me, yes, ignorance is bliss. Quran tells me avoid those things that don't concern you. And so Imam Ali teaches us, he says, if you want to maximize the strength of your intellect, avoid those things that do not concern you. This is when it, with regards to the things that strengthen our intellect. On the other hand, Imam Ali teaches us on some of the things that limit and they weaken our intellect. They weaken it. They limit its capacity and its strength. What does he say? One example. He tells us, if you are capable of doing so, if you are capable of speaking the truth, but you express shame, you're capable of speaking the truth in a situation, but you are ashamed to speak the truth. This does what? It weakens the intellect. You have the capacity, you have the capability to say the truth, to stand up for the truth, but you're ashamed. You're embarrassed or you prioritize something else. You say, well, you know what? My work is much more important. My position at my job is much more important than speaking up for the truth. The deal, the money that I'm going to make out of this deal is much more important than me speaking out for the truth, speaking up against injustice or against falsehood. I have the capacity. I'm capable, but I feel shy. I feel ashamed. Or I prioritize something else. Imam Ali says, this does what? It weakens the intellect. It drains its battery. Every time I have the capacity to say the truth, but I don't, it drains the capacity and the capability of my intellect. In another hadith, he says, Imam Ali says, إِعْجَابُ الْمَرْءِ بِنَفْسِهِ دَلِيلٌ عَلَىٰ ضَعْفِ عَقْلِهِ He says, if you want evidence, for the weakness of someone's intellect, see whether he or she expresses self-pride and self-conceit. Self-conceit, arrogance, right? Thinking highly of yourself, being proud, boastful of oneself. Imam Ali says, this is one of the strongest evidences, proof for the weakness of one's intellect. We have to be humble. We are expected to express humility, to avoid being conceited, to avoid arrogance. The Quran always reminds us to avoid arrogance in all of our affairs. We should never allow our accomplishments to get to our head. The degrees that I stack up, the position in society, my place, you know, in, at my job, I'm the CEO of a company, right? I have a PhD. I have this position in society. I have this much wealth. I have these possessions. I have these many friends. I have this place here or there. Never allow these accomplishments to get to your head, to make you arrogant, to make you boastful and proud. Because pride, it decreases our intellect. One of the reasons why we get tested sometimes, dear friends, why does God test us sometimes with sickness or with poverty or with loss of health or money or children or whatever it may be? Why? One reason is to keep us humble sometimes, to keep us in check. Because if I get everything, if everything is perfect for me, what happens to me? إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَيَطْغَى The Qur'an says. It's just a push of a button. All of us have a button inside us. Right? You push this button, suddenly what happens? We become arrogant and proud. So sometimes God wants to put us in check. So God tests us with some challenges and some difficulties to remind us, hey, listen, be humble. Be humble. Remind us of who we really are to remind us of our essence, what we really are, 
our origin and our destination. Imam Ali says, I am astonished at the one who expresses pride and arrogance, the one who is boastful. Why? He says, because if he or she thinks about themselves, their essence, what they are, he says, look at us human beings. What is our beginning? Our beginning is a drop of semen. And our end is a dead carcass. This is our beginning and this is our end. And in between, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says what? In between you are a vessel that is constantly carrying dirt and impurities and germs and bacteria and everything else that's filthy. Are we not constantly carrying filth within us? We're vessels for filth. Imam Ali says, if this is our beginning and this is our end and this is our whole life, what reason do we express arrogance and pride? For what reason? To remind us, humility is to remember our origin and our destination. And the Quran tells us this. God says, Minha khalaqnakum. Where did we come from? We came from the earth, from the dust. God says, Minha khalaqnakum. We created you from the earth, from the dust. Wa fiha nu'idukum. And to the dust you will return. When we die, where are we placed, huh? Are we sent to the moon? We're put in the dust. We're buried underground. All of us, we're all buried under the ground. The Quran says, we created you from the earth, from the ground, and to it you will return. And from it, once again, you will be resurrected. We're created from dust. To dust we will return. And from the dust, once again, we will be resurrected before our Lord. This is our essence. This is our origin. And this is our destination. So Imam Ali teaches us to be humble. And being humble strengthens our intellect. It preserves our intellect. Imam Ali was the master of humility. The traditions, they say, that after he was struck on the mor morning of the 19th of the month of Ramadan, he was struck while he was in prayer in Masjid al-Kufa. Imam Ali shouted, he called out, Fustu wa Rabbil Kaaba. By the Lord of the Kaaba, today I have found victory. This is my victorious moment. And then the traditions, they, sa they said that Imam Ali fell to the ground. Because of the strike, he fell to the ground and he began to repeat this verse that I mentioned. Minha khalaqnakum wa fiha nu'idukum wa minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. Imam Ali repeats this verse. From the dust we were created and to it we will return and from it will we, we will be brought forth again. He began to repeat this verse. The companions, they ran around after Imam Ali was struck. They ran around trying to capture the perpetrator, the culprit, Abdul Rahman ibn Muljam, until they caught him. They caught him and they brought him forth before Amir al Mu'mineen. Imam Ali was in that weak state. He had been struck by the poisonous sword. He turned to Ibn Muljam and he asked him, he said, O oh, servant of God, O oh, servant of God, why did you do what you did? Was I a bad imam to you? Was Imam Ali a bad imam? Could, have, could he have been a bad leader, a bad imam? Told him, why did you do what you do? Was I a bad leader to you? Was I a bad imam to you ever? The traditions, they tell us, that after he was arrested and after he was captured, after Ibn Muljam was captured, Imam Ali was then taken to be taken care of. And then when he was able to gain some of his strength again, he turned to his companions and his followers. He turned to his sons, to Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Hussein and the rest, 
And the first thing that he did, he asked them, he said, how is your prisoner? Tell me how he is. You've brought for me milk and medication and water. You're taking care of me. Tell me, how is your prisoner? In what condition is he? He was brought forth in front of Imam Ali. Once again, Imam Ali noticed that they had tied his hands very tightly. He turned to his companions. He said, loosen the tight, loosen the restraints on his hands and make sure that you feed him and make sure that you clothe him and make sure that you quench his thirst. Do not leave him unattended to. Some of them, they told him, Ya Amir al muminin this is your killer. This is your enemy. This is the one who stood and he struck you and he wants to kill you. How is it that you're asking us to do so? Imam Ali alayhi salam, he replied, he said, we are the household of mercy and compassion. This is how we've been trained. This is how we've been taught. This is how Rasulullah taught us. He taught us to deal with others around us with mercy, with compassion, with kindness, even to our enemies, even to those who hurt us and harm us, that we should extend our care and concern for them. So take care of him, give him food, and give him drink, and wait until we see what happens with myself. If I die as a result, then you may punish him accordingly. But if I live, then keep his matter in my hand, and I will show com compassion and mercy to him. Allahu Akbar. This is Amir al -Mumin. This is what he teaches us. He teaches us what it means to be humble even to your enemies. Even to those who hurt you and those who harm you. O oh, Amirul Mu'mineen. O oh, Imam Ali. You commanded care for your enemy who was your killer. He was the one that struck you. But yet you commanded care and mercy towards him. But do you know my master, Amirul Mu'mineen? Do you know what your enemies did to you? Do you know what they did to your innocent and beloved family members and progeny? Amir al muminin do you know what they did to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? What they did to Hussein on the day of Ashura? Imam Amir al muminin do you know what they did to Zainab? Do you know what they did to Zainu al-Abideen? Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayalamu al-ladheena zalamu ayya munqalabin yanqalibun. Wal-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen. Brothers and sisters, tonight is Thursday night. It's a holy night, of course, the 19th of the month of Ramadan, the nights in which we commemorate the martyrdom of Amir al muminin These are holy nights. These are blessed nights. The last 10 nights of the month of Ramadan are the most important nights. During these nights, let us come together and remember those who are sick, those who are ill. Many people in our community, locally in other places of the world who are sick, ill, some of them are critically ill in the hospital, we ask Allah, we pray to God Almighty, the most compassionate and the most merciful to bestow his peace upon them, to bestow them with strength, to bring about a full and speedy recovery for all who are sick and all who are ill. We pray that Allah accepts the little that we have to offer during these holy days and nights. We pray that Allah forgives our sins, our misdeeds, our shortcomings, and that he accepts all of our prayers and supplications and fasting, and he gives us the ability to complete this blessed month of Ramadan and to achieve his mercy and compassion. We pray to Allah to grant us the honor of visiting the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, in this life and of attaining their shafa'a and intercession in the hereafter. We pray to Allah to hasten the reappearance of our final Imam, Al-Hujjat ibn al-Hasan al-Mahdi, ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif And we ask Allah, we pray to Allah to bless the souls of all of the mu'mineen and mu'minat, the marhumin, those who have passed away, 
our loved ones, our family members, our friends, all around the world, and especially to bless the souls of our brothers and sisters, those who were martyred just today in northern Afghanistan, in mazar sharif Dozens who were killed. And this was only a few days after others in Afghanistan were also killed at a boys' school. They were murdered in cold blood. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on their souls and to grant their families patience and strength. And we pray to Allah to relieve all who are living under oppression for their souls and for the souls of all of the mu'mineen and mu'minat. Let us recite Surah Al-Fatiha ma'a salat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allah wa sallam. Brothers and sisters, just a quick reminder that uh, our programs continue, inshallah. Tomorrow we will have Friday prayer, Jum'ah prayer at 1 p.m. And tomorrow night we will be observing Laylatul Qadr here at the center. The program begins with Maghrib and Isha prayer at 7.40 sharp, followed by Iftar, inshallah, and then Dua al-Uftitah, a short lecture, and then the A'mal of Laylatul Qadr. Uh, and we will continue until about 12 or 1 uh, a.m., inshallah. And then finally, there will also be suhoor that is served uh, to go. So all of you and your families are encouraged to come and to participate. And uh, we'll also be streaming live, inshallah, on the IECOC YouTube channel. May Allah accept your deeds. And inshallah, we will see you in the upcoming nights. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad.